Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Bill McDermott, who is chairman and CEO of ServiceNow um, at the Milken Institute Global Conference. Bill, nice to see you. Thank you, Diane. Good to be with you. Um, I love the talk. You're talking actually about corporate governance here. You are one of the few leaders I know who seem to have a delightful experience with a shareholder activist. At least it started out that way, right? Yeah, of course. When you were over at SAP. Right. Talk about that. When you just, because I want, everybody, that's the biggest fear any CEO must have is, hi, I'm here and I've just bought a big chunk of your company. Well, I think the whole thing is really shared values and common goals. And if you can listen respectfully to other opinions, even if they're not yours, you can get to a place where we can all agree that we want the same thing. And I believe that we all have to be in search of perfection and doing a great job. And when you're in search of getting better every single day, that's kind of contagious. Whether it's an activist investor situation, your employees, your partners, or your customers. So Let's just keep getting better. That was the way, was that the way you thought about it when you first heard that El, it was Elliot, right? It was yeah, Elliot. It was. That they had bought a major stake in the company because you wouldn't necessarily know that it was a benevolent, we're excited and we want to see you do more kind of situation. I, I just feel like you can go into any situation in life if you have really great dreams and goals for whatever that endeavor is. You play in sports, you're in business, you're in a situation where you're having a financial discussion. How are we going to be great today? And there's lots of different approaches to that, but I'm all about getting better. And if somebody has a better idea than I have, I want to hear it. Do most shareholder activists usually have a better idea? No, I think similarly to my concepts, everybody wants to grow businesses. Yeah. Everybody wants to expand margins, be more profitable, and you get there by focusing on customers, building the best products in the world, and then having the will to win. It's hard to argue once you sit at the table about those dimensions. And usually, no matter what the investor goals are, if they see you're that kind of leader, they can buy in pretty quickly. So before we get off this topic, let me put on my uh, CEO hat. What advice do you have to leaders um, when you first hear that somebody is, whether they're, they bought a stake in your company, that you've got activist shareholders, they're coming to your meeting, what's, what's your general tactic? Well, the anticipation is generally always a lot worse than the realization. Mm -hmm. Sit down, have a conversation, see what's on their mind. You obviously have plans and things on your mind. Let's do a mind meld and see how it goes. And in that situation, you knew right away you were on the same plane, or did Absolutely. you have- Absolutely, there was no issue. No friction. There was no friction because we both wanted the same thing. We want a fast growing cloud business at the time. We want margins to expand properly over a period of time. And ultimately, there's lots of different ways of getting that done. And it just so happened that the way we wanted to get that done was perfectly consistent with Elliot. And we had a great meeting and a great friendship still to this day. That's well, that's there you go, a happy story. So let, I want to take you to another happy story, which is ServiceNow. You've had great earnings. You've also not been one of the tech companies that has laid off right. a lot of people. Was that intuitive business decision or was it actually more a decision of the heart than the head? It's a little of both, um, but we're a growth company. So when you're a growth company, and in the last couple of years, we created 10,000 jobs. So why would you lay people off if you just spent your intentional business professional acumen investing in 10,000 new jobs? Did you not consider them carefully when you did them in the first place? Well, we did. And so the question then becomes, how are you gonna continue to grow fast enough to afford those jobs and hopefully add some new ones. Mm -hmm. So it never even entered my mind that we would lay people off. We just hired them. We need them. We want them. We love them. And we're building a company that will be the defining enterprise software company of the 21st century. So we need a culture that can uphold that kind of promise. You've been in the technology space, so you know the mindset. Why are we seeing so many tech companies lay people off after reporting excellent earnings? Well, you gotta ask them that. But, you know, these are wonderful companies and they've done great things. And in some cases, they're the largest, most significant brands in the world. So 
I believe every company and every leader is entitled to their own strategy. Mm -hmm. Ours is a little bit different. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's a little bit different and we're going to stick to our own knitting and focus on our business and take care of our business. One of the things that's interesting is that you have the CEO and the chairman hat, which is kind of controversial sometimes because, you know, back last crisis, they told us to split them up. Philosophically, do you think they belong together? I love the fact that they are together. We're, first of all, in my case, I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. The original founder of our company is the one and only great Fred Luddy. Yeah. And Fred Luddy is on our board and he's committed to being there for the long term. And so the soul of the company is the founder. Right. And that's awesome. That doesn't change. But what's really good about having chairman and CEO aligned is I understand where the board is coming from at a deep emotional level. We spend our time focused on fixing problems and solving things versus giving ourselves recognition letters at the board meeting. And having that alignment is really big. And then at the same time, to have a management team as CEO completely aligned with the board on our strategy and the dimensions of executing on that strategy is special. So I can see the benefits of it, and I think it's paying dividends in the results. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you're seeing the business landscape right now? I know you talked a bit, you know, your earnings, but you know, there's so much concern about headwinds, inflation, and yet so much pressure to have digital transformation and the right. things that you're in the front lines of. What are you seeing in terms of, like, take us into the rooms where we don't get to go? There's a lot of mixed signals out there. And I work for the companies we serve. And I've met several CEOs today. And essentially... Are they nervous? They're happy? Not, they're not as nervous as you might think. You know, the headlines are generally a little bit worse than the reality. But they understand that digital transformation is the only way forward. You have to digitize these companies. 40% of the CEOs in the world today do not believe that in 10 years their businesses will be viable if they don't transform them and digitize them. So all companies have to be tech companies, all companies have to be software companies, and 71% of the board of directors and CEOs in the world say that that's their number one goal. 95% of the CEOs say, I have to digitally transform. So we're probably in a sweet spot in that regard. Yeah. But what makes us unique is I protect all the underlying systems of record that they've invested in over the last half century. Mm -hmm. I just make everything else work better mm -hmm. on an end-to-end -end basis. And that's what they love. How am I going to give my employees the best experience? What am I going to do to satisfy and keep my customers loyal? How can I build 750 million net new applications in the next two years? All of this is done on the backbone of service now. And that's why we're going to be the defining one. So if you, I want to walk back a little bit to your history, because I know you, you, from Amityville, I know you bought a store, I think, when you were in high school. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, if you could go back even and give advice, you've been in several CEO roles. What do you think makes you very effective? As a, do you think you're more effective as a CEO now than you were, like, say, starting out at Xerox when you weren't a CEO? What, what lessons have you learned? I, I think that the dream, you know, in my book, I, I talk about winners having yeah. a dream. But I also think winners are in constant pursuit of perfection. And you never... Isn't perfection the enemy of the whatever? The... I, I think the idea of perfection is really recognizing that I'm better than I was yesterday and I'm not as good as I'm going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I haven't lived my best day. I haven't solved my biggest problem. I haven't led my greatest organization forward yet, but I want to. Mm -hmm. And I think the people around you feel that passion and that desire and that hunger so we try to stay hungry, we try to stay humble, just the way I was when I was a 16-year-old entrepreneur serving customers coffee at 5 a.m. in the morning. I'm hungry, I'm humble, and I'm ready to go. What do you think has shaped you when you think about what you gleaned from Xerox? Because Xerox, is a, you were left an interesting time. It's as much an inspiration, a bit of a cautionary tale too, right? I mean, not yeah. to diss Xerox. I know you're on a panel with Ursula Burns, who did a great job there, but when you look at all the companies that have fallen by the wayside, 
they, they have people who are inspired. They try to do the right thing. Where do you see your peers falling short or yourself? Well, first of all, I want to say Xerox is family to me. And when I think about people like Ann Mulcahy and Tom Dolan and Barry Rand, Norm Ricard, uh, Paul Allaire, David Kearns. I mean, these are names that are embedded in my heart and they're family to me. And I think that's the way it was at Xerox as a 21-year-old kid getting your first job and you break that Emerson Fullwood gave me when I first entered into the corporate world. Without his vote, I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. And I never sell that lightly. I think companies have to keep changing. Markets are going to evolve and you have to see around the next corner. We'll be a different company five years from now than we are today because we have to evolve. For example, when you think about generative AI and the fact that we built that into the platform along with robotics, process automation, and process mining, and so many other technologies to really on an end-to-end -end basis transform business and keep business simple for our customers. There'll be new things. But you know, you think about generative AI, it took Netflix three and a half years to get a million users. It took Twitter two years. Have you played around with it? Of course. What have you, like, I, I tried to make it do limericks and it wasn't great. What have you done? Well, with what's interesting in the corporate world is we don't deal with the hallucinations that come with the public internet. You're dealing with real corporate data and data that's clean. So as you take clean data, you can think about a world of texting to code, texting to workflow automation, texting to build new applications. This is a transformative move. And we built it into the platform and we're basing the entire company on it because you're in service to people, making them more productive, making business more efficient, making business capable of moving mountains. That's what ServiceNow is all about. Let me ask you one other question, which is, um, I think about whether it's the trust barometers, where people trust CEOs now more than they trust government, yeah. media, I don't take it personally, but what, what is the role of, of the business leader? Because it's, you know, I mean, it's such a divisive country. People are kind of, you know, not as uh, enthusiastic as you are about right. the future necessarily. So what do you think your responsibility is or the responsibility of people that are in leadership roles? I think people have to have a voice. And I spent a lot of time building voice groups within our company where we can listen to different points of view. As a corporation, we can serve many different points of view. But in the end, our ultimate responsibility is to our customers, our employees, our shareholders, and the ecosystem effect that a great brand and a great platform can build into society. We have responsibilities and we also have a job to do. And it's a delicate dance, as you know, but it's one that we're excited to do. What is your, to what faults did you have to look at yourself and say, well, here's an area I don't think I'm so strong in? Oh, there's so many areas I don't think I'm so strong in. But I think the main thing is, one of my great mentors once said, I do what I do often, and I don't do what I don't do so well at all. So what Play I try to strengths. do, I try to hire over my head. So if everybody on my management team is a little bit better than me, especially at their functional responsibility, I might just be okay over time. And you're optimistic about the U.S.? Because, you know, there's so many different, like, we don't know what's going on in China in terms of innovation and competition. Never bet against the United States of America. This country always figures it out. It's the innovation machine of the world. It's the envy of the world. It's got the biggest heart, and it'll always be on top. And anybody that bets against the United States never ends up too well. Anything else you'd like to add? To add? Anything, whether it's advice or a soothsayer? Help us see around the corner. It sounds like you're optimistic. I think I opened up the quote in my book when Robert Kennedy once said, some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? Why not us? Why not now? And if not us, who? Let's go. You should run for office. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to announce, you can tell us now. But no. Plenty good of time to, for good that. Good to see you. Thanks very much, Thank Bill. you, Diane. Cheers. Thank you very Thank much. You. Nice meeting you.